yet another week into the war in Ukraine and we are seeing a lot of developments not only on the ground, not only in terms of military conflicts and fighting but also the international scenario. Earlier this week we had two top US officials visiting Ukraine and but the most important development has been the decision by Russia to not supply natural gas to Poland and Bulgaria because they have refused to pay in rubles. Now Russia had earlier indicated that certain unfriendly countries would have to pay in rubles. What are the implications of all this? We'll be discussing on this episode of Mapping Fault Lines. We are joined by Prabir Purkaista. Prabir, so like I said, a lot of developments in addition to what I had mentioned, the UN uh, Secretary General also visiting both Moscow and Kiev, some concern being expressed as there were attacks when he was in Kiev. But the most important news of the week, especially from a global level, seems to be the issue of natural gas again and energy supplies. So Gazprom saying that it will no longer supply natural gas to two key countries, Poland and Bulgaria, and many other countries now having to make this crucial choice whether to pay in rubles or not, many of the European countries that is, some have already agreed and certain other companies have set up accounts with Gazprom. So how do we understand the energy situation in midst of all this? Has Russia's gambit that way worked? Let's step back a bit. If we take the war in Ukraine as you see it, there are really three kinds of war taking place. One is a physical war. People have characterized it not just a war between Ukraine and Russia or Russia's attack on Ukraine, but also NATO's expansion to the east. So de facto, it's a war between NATO and Russia being carried out by Ukrainians on one side. And as people have said, uh, NATO is willing to fight this war to the last Ukrainian. So that's one way of looking at the war. We'll take a step back from that because that's, that's something that you know is another discussion for another day. But if we look at the other two wars, one is the information war, which is, of course, the West is winning hands down because they control the Internet, they control the largest digital monopolies today, and, of course, the major newspapers, news organizations in the world. The other third war, which is what we have talked about, is essentially the economic war of which the energy war is a part. Right. And there, Russia has always had a strong hand because without Europe, the, without Russian gas, even oil and coal, the European Union is going to be at a uh, risk, at risk of its essentially its financial sector coming, you know, industrial sectors coming down. And if you could see a scenario which a lot of the industries will shut down, cascading effects on the economy is taking place. And Germany is, of course, at risk, but so is Italy, so is Spain. So to a lesser extent, so is France. So this has been the way Russia has held a strong hand. Right. The fact that it is a supplier of energy to European Union, it's the largest supplier of uh, uh, gas to European Union. So I think 40% of their gas comes from, more than 40% comes from Russia. So that's something that whatever they say cannot be taken out. And uh, energy experts have said even taking out oil from uh, European Union, Russian oil from European Union, is not going to be easy. So given that, what, is, what happened was initially, when sanctions were there on Russian Central Bank, it meant that even if Russia received payments, those, those dollars or euros it would receive would not be accessible by Russia. That it would lie essentially in accounts with European banks and therefore be under sanctions to the extent that the earlier $300 billion of Russia's foreign exchange reserves are. This is what Putin had said when he announced the ruble for gas uh, mechanism, that we are not stupid, that we are not going to give you gas for free, because that's what it really meant, that we will give you gas, you will pay us in euros, and that money will stay in your banks. So though Ursula von der Leyen has been saying black pill, et cetera, et cetera, but nobody has tried to answer what Russia has been saying, that effectively, if we give you gas and you don't pay us in rubles, but you pay us in your bank account, which then you've already seized once and you can seize again. And even those banks will not be able to deal with Russia because Russian Central Bank is under sanctions. So given that your basic argument that you will not pay us in rubles is basically saying that you will take gas, but you'll keep the money. So Russia has worked out a clever mechanism, and what experts are saying, it does not violate the EU sanctions. It says Gazprom Bank, you open an account there, 
dollar account, you also open a ruble account, and the transfer between Russia, do dollar and ruble would be made by Gazprom Bank and not you. And therefore, that does not come under sanctions. Now, I'm not a financial uh, person, so I don't know how this works. But I have seen, for instance, in Naked Capitalism, uh, Yves Smith has been writing on this for quite some time. I'm sure she understands finances better than you and I do. And she said, yes, this makes sense. It works. And this is what we now see, that the European Union has made a statement saying, yes, this may not violate EU sanctions. Right. And we have a set of companies who are now lining up to open Gazprom Bank dollar and ruble account and take the uh, take payment, make the payments through that. So we have German companies, Italian companies, other companies lining up to do that. And it seems that the next set of transactions will take place in May. So it's a little time at the moment for both to see how this works. But for by all accounts, these companies are now falling in line. Bulgaria and Poland were outliers because they both have very small amounts of gas they were buying from Russia. Poland has not been buying, has been making alternative uh, su supply sources. They have been also doing a lot of LNG uh, regasification. So they, they have already decided that they will move away from Russian gas for quite some time, not recently. And Bulgaria has access to other sources. Therefore, they are not really affected. And Germany is believed to be buying more to actually offset some of these also. There is the reverse flow, as it's called in the Yamal pipeline, instead of gas coming from Russia through Poland to Germany. Germany is sending some gas back to Poland. But even then, Poland and Bulgaria is small players at the moment, how much they are buying from Russia. So the big player, and that's always been the big issue, is Germany. Then you have Italy. Then you have other countries in the European Union. None of them are going to risk their economy. So as far as the ruble for gas is concerned, Russia seems to want this hand. What it has also done is stabilize the ruble. If you see the sharp drop in ruble, which really tanked immediately after the nuclear sanctions, as we call them, the nuclear economic sanctions that was imposed on the Russian Central Bank and other banks, Russian banks, the ruble tanked. But it has come up now, and it is trading virtually the same level as it did before this economic sanctions are imposed. So yes, Russia has lost $300 billion, which is still frozen by the West. What they will do with it, we don't know. Afghanistan, we saw what Biden did with it. But nevertheless, this round, it seems we have to say, is Russia's round. What happens for other primary commodities, what happens to inflation in the uh, in European Union, we don't know. Because, you know, gas prices have gone up by 20%, which makes even if Russia drops its supplies exactly. by a fraction to European Union, they still get more money. Right. In fact, in the last uh, two months of war, uh, Russia has made got more money by selling gas to European Union, even after the sales have come down than they did before. So in that sense, gas price coming up offsets for the reduction of gas supplies. So both things taken together, we have to say, on this issue, Russia has scored, but much bigger threats to the world exist because we have now fertilizer crisis, we have food crisis. In India, we have a coal crisis, for example. All this are also consequences of the war in Ukraine. Right. So, Prameer, uh, to ask a bit of a crystal ball question, <laughs> the West had a plan which was that they would impose these nuclear sanctions. As you said, there would be a drastic collapse in the Russian economy. The ruble's value would go, of course. There would be scarcity shortages. There would be huge internal resentment. Putin would face the pressure. And there would be some kind of regime change. Seems to be the larger hope because if you look at some of the pronouncements, that's what is that sort seems to have been the intention. But do we see that the Russian economy has managed to weather this crisis and uh, attain somewhat to stability even within wartime? And when you can consider examples like Iran or Venezuela, these methods really haven't ever worked. You know, apart from the fact that these methods of sanctioning countries, economies, hoping that therefore there'll be regime change, has never worked, as you said. Either Iran and Venezuela are classic examples of that. So I don't think in Russia's case also this is likely to happen because there seems to be widespread support in Russia for what Putin has done. And this tends to happen during wars, and right. we know that. So that is a far cry. It can happen only if there is a strong opposition 
in the beginning, and B, if the war aims are seen to be obviously not being fulfilled, and therefore the, the you know, questions of why this happened. I don't think that is also likely to be true because basic stake in Russian people is the Donbas region and people who identify themselves as Russian speakers, if not ethnic Russians. So there is a solidarity there, which is what Putin is playing on. So I don't think the war is going to rebound on him, provided the economy holds. Yes. And here is the biggest mistake that the, uh, the Americans seem to be making, because they think they have been convinced by their own propaganda that Russia is nothing but a gas station. Russia is a primary producer of a whole range of commodities, including food and fertilizer, something which is basic to everybody. It is also produces the metals. A lot of the metals, primary commodities again, are produced in Russia. Its military manufacturing is almost entirely indigenized. They don't buy from others. So in that sense, a military uh, capability that Russia has built up is going to continue. They can continue to manufacture missiles and whatever they need for the war. And they, uh, from what we can see, China does have their, have their back. So if it is a question of chips and other uh, uh, things that Russia may require, it appears that China and even countries like India who are buying gas and uh, oil from uh, Russia would be willing, therefore, to supply those goods, maybe buy it from others and send it to Russia. So as long as Russia still remains in unsanctioned, by I think 90% of the uh, countries in the world. It's only about a small number of West European and North America which has sanctioned Russia. Given that, I think the f idea that it will be completely starved of all things it requires is a far cry. Okay. If that doesn't happen, and it is self-sufficient in primary commodities, well, Western Europe is not. The United States is better placed. So, then we are going to see a European crisis. And if there is a European crisis, what happens, we don't really know. So it is definitely going to weaken Western Europe significantly. They probably will surrender to United States militarily because right. if they want to build up their military uh, capacities, what they will do is buy weapons from the United States. So therefore, bolstering really the military industrial complex in the, in the United States. If that happens, then Europe is going to be further weakened, further in the grip of the United States vis-a-vis -vis NATO. NATO really means, in this case, US leadership. So given all of that, I think net loss in this is Western Europe's. Some gain for the United States because they control Western Europe more. But I don't see Russia weakening. In fact, I see Russia strengthening as a consequence of all of this. And it does put a big question mark on the dollar hegemony in the world. Right. Which country, including India, would like to now park all its reserves in the United States or in dollars, knowing that it can be seized at any point of time if the US disagrees with what that country is doing? Absolutely. So the basic underpinning of the global economy where the reserve currency is dollar, I think that has, this has raised a very big question with respect to that. Absolutely. On the other hand, of course, Prabir, it doesn't seem like the United States is willing to consider these options because, like I said, Antony Blinken and Lloyd Austin were in uh, Kiev. They made some very uh, powerful statements where they seem to indicate that the cause of the Ukrainians and the cause of the United States was pretty much the same. The we, we, we was the <laughs> constant, uh, you know, refrain. And one of the things they seem to say also was that the aim was to make sure that the Russians really bled, that they didn't, it didn't seem like they wanted an end to this war at all. So do we see that also a continuation of this trend where the West is really trying to push this conflict to last as long as it's possible? Well, as I said, the uh, attempt is to let uh, Russia bleed. And in this, if the Ukrainians have to be sacrificed, so be it. The fact is Ukraine... The Ukrainian state seems to be captured by the United States after the what's called the Maidan Revolution. And that is what the stranglehold of the United States on the Ukrainian state is there. 
Of course, you have roused a huge amount of nationalistic uh, sentiments in Western Ukraine, who seem themselves now distinct from Russians. So you have that chauvinistic basis. A lot of neo-Nazis very operating out of Ukraine, as we know, as of battalion is only one of them. You have the right sector. You have also other formations. So given all of that, there is this issue of how long Ukraine will fight and will it actually ask for peace. It's interesting, initially there were peace moves by Ukraine. Mm -hmm. There were negotiations. Financial Times said there's a 15-point charter which has almost been agreed to. It seemed after Zelensky had said certain things, Russian said, yes, we are looking at possibility of peace, and it pulled back from Kiev. Now what we see is that none of that is in play. None of that is happening. On top of that, what we see also that globally, though this is perhaps the most dangerous conflict that we have seen in our lifetime, possibility of two nuclear armed powers getting into the act right. and therefore extremely dangerous, particularly when uh, countries like uh, John, no, Prime Minister of uh, Boris Johnson. UK, Boris Johnson, and his, I think, Deputy Defence Minister claims that, uh, you know, it's all right to hit targets inside Russia and we will, we will give them weapons to do so. Virtually, that is a statement. All of that is dangerous, but there is another danger. If European gas supplies are affected, what you're going to see is the cutbacks that Europe has promised on, uh, for instance, uh, emissions, greenhouse emissions, they're not going to be able to keep. So they're going to go back to coal. Okay. So all this talk about <coughs> coal being cut back, transition taking place, is unlikely to happen. That's always, always what happens in a war. The long-term goals are sacrificed for the short-term goals. The United States probably doesn't even recognize there is global warming. I don't think they believe in it. So they would be quite happy to say, forget about all those goals. At the moment, our goal is to weaken Putin and Russia. So let's get done with that. So I think this, with this, we are in a very dangerous situation. Unfortunately, we don't, as we talked last time also, we don't seem to have a global leadership today, which is not the United States, not Russia, not China, not European Union, which can then make appeals to both sides that, you know, please discuss, negotiate, come to an agreement, because otherwise what you are doing is extremely dangerous for both you and for all of us. That kind of international, uh, shall we say, initiative doesn't seem to be appearing in any side. And in the United States, on Europe, what we see is the war sentiment seem to have captured the states, the state machinery completely, and also the opposition as well as the ruling parties. Right. Given that, we, I think we are in an extremely dangerous situation, as much about nuclear war possibilities as with about global warming, because we have an interregnum of about three years within mm -hmm. which we can reverse this, or we are looking at very bleak scenarios. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Praveen, for talking to us. That's all we have time for today. We'll be covering many such issues in future episodes of Mapping Fault Lines. Until then, keep watching NewsClick.